Welcome to Mister Creations. I'm your host, AJ, and today we're talking to Dr. Kinko Ido of Arkansas University at Little Rock, where she is Professor of Sociology. We will be talking about the Ainu people of Japan. They're an indigenous group living mostly in Hokkaido, the northern island of Japan. The following clip is of Dr. Ido's YouTube film, Have You Heard of the Ainu? in which a lady is singing an Ainu song. After this, we'll get to the show. Please enjoy. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You can tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do, please. I am Dr. Kinko Ito, and I am a professor of sociology at University of Arkansas at Little Rock uh, in the United States. Um, I obtained my master's and doctor's degrees from the Ohio State University in Ohio. And uh, my specialties of, of the areas of research are popular culture, uh, especially Japanese comics, uh, ladies' comics, and the Ainu of Japan. The Ainu are the indigenous people of Japan, and uh, I did an ethnographic study in Hokkaido a few times. And uh, I also publish ebooks at Amazon's Kindle store with my pen name, K.I. Peter. Uh, these books are about travels, uh, traveling to Fiji, Colombia, and um, Korea, Scandinavia, and all these countries, as well as uh, my experiences of uh, death and dying or uh, breast cancer and all these other things. So um, thank you so much for inviting me today. And I'm going to talk about the Ainu of Japan today. Thank you. Can you tell everyone who the Ainu are and where they originate? Okay, the Ainu people are the indigenous, indigenous people of Japan, the word Ainu, just like in any other uh, indigenous groups, means basically humans mm. or humans in general as opposed to gods or man or father, depending on the contextual uh, situations. But just like other groups, Ainu means humans as opposed to gods. And the Ainu are an ethnic group, but it's also is a racial group as well. And uh, for some of you who are not familiar with the terms, a racial group uh, is characterized by biological characteristics, such as the skin color, hair texture, facial features, and so on, while an ethnic group is characterized by uh, its culture, like religion, food, clothing, and uh, whatsoever, language. So. Sometimes a racial group is an ethnic group as well, but sometimes an ethnic group may not be a racial group. I don't know uh, how to put it, but I think you understand what I'm saying, right? So the Ainu are both a racial group and an ethnic group. And uh, I think maybe the Jewish people are like that too, because yeah. if you convert into Judaism, then you become a Jew. So, um, you know, you are an ethnic group regarding the religion or the culture, but yeah. in racial, you are of a different skin color or whatever. Yeah. So um, the interesting thing is um, the Ainu and the non-Ainu Japanese have been intermarrying each other for such a long time. So today it is very difficult to find a full-blooded Ainu. Yes. The Ainu people in general live just like any Japanese. So, a lot of people may have uh, some kind of uh, image, you know, like these Ainu people, uh, they look different, they wear different clothes, different hairstyles, diff speak different language, or uh, worship different kinds of gods or whatever, but they are just like, you know, uh, general Japanese public, yeah. you know, drive a car, they use computers, and they play video games, and so on. So... Images of the Ainu are quite different in contemporary Japan. 
And the ancestors of the Ainu people lived in northern part of Tohoku. That means, uh, the, the tip of the northern, you know, part of Honshu, which is yeah. the, the biggest island of Japan. Japan only has four islands. So in the north is Hokkaido. And then there's Honshu, the biggest one, and Shikoku, the tiny one, and then Kyushu. And then Okinawa is down in the south. So, the northern part of Honshu, there were Ainu people there. And then uh, the Ainu people lived in Hokkaido and Kuril Islands yes. in Saharan. So now uh, the Kuril Islands in Saharan are Russian territories because of the war and everything. But in those days, that was Ainu Mosir, M-O-S-I-R. Ainu Mosir means Ainu's homeland. Mm-hmm. And some Ainu people told me, the reason why this was their land was because of the names of the uh, locations. Mm. You know, it's just like here in Little Rock, okay? There are certain names that are of Indian, you know, Native American descent kind of thing, okay? Like, so when you come to Little Rock and then you go to a restaurant and then they would have um, uh, O-U-I-C-H-I-T-A hamburger, something like that. And then no, we, we, what is this? And it's a watchdog, for example. Mm-hmm. And it again comes from the native people who are here. That's what I heard. Yes. So go to certain parts of northern, okay, uh, Honshu and also Hokkaido. There are a whole bunch of names that derive from the Ainu language. Okay. And then the same is true for the southern part of Sahalin and the Creole Islands. But, um, and we're going to talk more about this, but that is where their ancestors are from. Uh, the history of them. What What are some unique features of of their culture? You know, the history of the Ainu is just like the history of um, African Americans here in the U.S. or the Native Americans as well. Yeah, uh, is a history of um, you know exploitation, plunder, and oppression, and so on. And uh, when I teach about the Ainu people, you know, I do have students who are Native Americans. Mm-hmm. And um, when I teach Japanese culture and society class, and we talk about what happened to the Ainu, and then a lot of these Native American students is, whoa, that's exactly the same here in America. So uh, basically, historically speaking, okay, so Hokkaido, which is the no- in the Northern Island, of Japan, Japanese territory was there, okay? And yeah. then, uh, like, the, at the end of, like, 19th century, the Russians are coming from the north looking for um, the ports that do not freeze in the winter time. Mm-hmm. And Japan opened its country in 1867. You know, Commodore Perry, an American officer, came to Japan and knocked on the door. Hey, Japan, you know, wake yeah. up. You know, open the doors. So the Japanese government opened the, the country. But so there were Americans or Europeans or Russians, you know, coming all over to Japan. And the Japanese government had to do something about this Hokkaido because the Ainu people can, you know, march with the Russians and say, no, yeah, we want to be with the Russians. Then the Japanese people are going to lose that territory, obviously. Yes. So. The government had to do something about Hokkaido. So um, in 1869, okay, the Meiji government established the Hokkaido Colonization Board. So this is just like when the United States, you know, these American people started to move westward, you know, to the west, to the west. So the Japanese government, okay, encouraged these people to immigrate, to move up north to Hokkaido and basically colonize it. So Ainu people who were there, they lost their land and then they lost their language and culture and everything else because of the assimilation yeah. process. So the Ainu kids had to go to, you know, certain schools and then they were forced to speak Japanese language. And they were like, you know, they were equal but separate kind of education, you know, the, these kids had. Okay. Mm-hmm. And 
they had to change their names to more Japanese sounding names sometimes because the Aina people have different names, you know, from Japanese names. And their hairdo, they have to <laughs> look more Japanese and yes. then they wear Japanese kimono and so on. So part of the reason why they pushed that assimilation process, they forced it onto the Ainu people was to show to the world, hey, the Ainu people are Japanese, thus Hokkaido definitely is Japanese territory. You know. And in doing so they they almost wiped out the culture. They did. And uh the interesting thing is, you know, the the major government did all these things in the name of modernization. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when we talk about any kind of these policies, we have to say, whose policies are we talking about? Or whose interest are we talking about? And obviously, it's the interest of the powerful, yes. you know. And um, another interesting thing was the Aino people did not, did not have written language. So this is another thing, too. Okay, now, so in order for a nation to function, you have to have have a language because you have to record your history or your business or your e- economy or whatsoever. You need to record everything, right? The I people did it orally because they did not have language. I mean, written, written language, okay? Because now uh, the Ainu language is written in Japanese or in Roman alphabets and so on. Mm-hmm. Up until then, everything was transmitted verbally. So, um, the, it was to the Ainu's disadvantage because they did not have a nation per se. Yeah, it makes it, makes it difficult to, when, when you, when you have a, a, a society that's oral and a society that requires you to write something, there's a dichotomy there that, uh, kind of, uh, you lose out because you're, you, it automatically makes you translate. And so things aren't going to be translated properly because one language doesn't have words that the other one does. And you mm-hmm. end up with the, uh, with the, uh, a tree, uh, representing a bush and so on, on and so forth. <laughs> and language is crucial for doing business. Yeah. You know, yeah. Interestingly enough, the Ainu people traded things. You know, not only with the Japanese, but with the Chinese or the Russians, which I think is quite interesting. I don't know how they did it without language, you know, because you may want to write down, you know, how many salmon you traded with tobacco, for example. I don't know how they did it. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so the Ainu language. Okay. We can talk a little bit more about that fantastic language, but they were basically replaced by the Japanese language, you know, so they have to change their names to more Japanese sounding names and then change their um, hairdos and clothing. And also their traditions were undermined as well. Yeah. The Japanese government, for example, considered Yomante, uh, which is ascending off the street of the bears, a barrack. And um, the Ainu people should not do that. Or uh, we are going to talk about the tattoos as well later. But mm-hmm. women had tattoos mm-hmm. and men wore earrings. Yeah. And the Japanese government said that that is, again, barbaric and you don't need these things. I mean, now, you know, how many men are wearing earrings? I mean, that that's cool. Yeah. Right? yeah. Okay. Or a lot of women have tattoos, too. So, mm-hmm. so it really is the social cultural context that determines what is normal and what is not normal, right? True. But when you look at all these people, uh, you know, they, they were pretty cool, I would say, from even from today's standpoint. Yeah. Okay. So women had tattoos around her um no. you know a mouth. Okay. So they would start out with make make a disinfectant and then they would basically uh, scrape the uh, surface of the skin with a small knife and then put soot or in some cases, some kind of, of a fabric dye. And then they make it bigger and bigger because they have to start in their teens while the skin is relatively soft. And then 
to be finished by the time they become an adult, young, young adult and so on. And also they would, um, you know, uh, put uh, tattoos on the forearms as well, you know, with uh, some kind of uh, beautiful um, designs, you know, and so on. So the Japanese government again said these tattoos are barbaric and they do not do that. But that was the sim- symbol of women's uh, womenhood, you know, like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In the, the, I think they, they viewed the, the beard as something beautiful. And so the, the mouth would kind of emulate that. Somewhat, or was I'm, it I'm not about that, but men do have beard. Okay, yeah, they have beard, and some some of them have long beard as well. Yeah, you know, like a Santa Claus, I would say. Okay, uh, that's great. Mm-hmm. And also, like uh, the tattoo is going to fade as time goes it's on. Fun. Yeah, so the women have to kind of put more soot, you but, know, to do maintenance. Yeah. <laughs> To maintain the tattoos and stuff like that. And actually, they did, you know, prohibit this, you know, during the major period, you know, which is about like 150 years ago or so. Mm-hmm. And, um, one of my Aino friends told me, like, when she was, she, I was in her 60s now, but when she was young, uh, she was walking with her, you know, their kids' friends, right? And then they're walking on the street and then there is a house which is a, a persimmon tree, and I think you know what persimmons are, right? It's yes. fruit. Okay, it's orange colored fruit. Yes. And there's so many persimmons. So uh, her friends and she said, "Well, maybe we can just steal one or two from there, and you know nobody would notice. So let's just have some persimmon for dessert today, you know, for the tea time or something, right?" Yes. So it start, you know. Try to get them. And then there was this old lady with a big tattoo on her mouth and came, Hey, you guys, you should not do that again. <laughs> and she said, Wow, what is that? What kind of mouth is that? You know, like she was so scared because she was too small. Yeah. Uh, she said that's her first memory of women's tattoos. Okay. So that lady was very, very old, obviously, because, True. you know, inhibited the tattooing. Mm. But that was her uh, memory. She said, I was scared to death because <laughs> this old lady yeah. with the tattoo, you know, because she didn't know what to make of that human being. You know what I mean? Because she's never. She's really never seen anyone with it yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 But anyway, another interesting thing about tattoos is like, in contemporary Japan, you know, you want to go to Japan and you want to go to a public bath. Yeah. You know, there are lots of hot springs in Japan. Yes. So some of them are co-ed. Some of them are not co-ed. They're separated into men and women's, yeah. right? But anyway, any bathhouse you go to, there is a little sign that says, those of you who have tattoos cannot enter. That, I would say, is discrimination, obviously, right? It is. The association is the tattoos and the gangsters. I think you're familiar with yeah. the, the, the Yakuza. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, they do have all this, uh, you know, full tattoo, you know, all over their body and stuff like a that. Sta- a status symbol of their, their, their... Criminality and the badness, you know, something like that. And also to them, it's the pride... And be, and also the symbol of your strength, you know, because it yep. it hurts. So you have to be a very tough, both you know, mind wise and body wise, because it really hurts and stuff like that. But that's their standard, you know. Yeah. So we tend to see and judge everyone using our own standard, right? Yes. So when you go to Japan, say no tattooed. Uh, men or women allowed in the public bath, okay? And then the government had prohibited women's tattooing and stuff like that. So so these are the kind of things that kind of fascinates me, you know? I mean, why is that? What's so so bad? Because, mm. you know, it's, things mean different things to different people, different values, different perspectives, different experiences and stuff like that, yeah. you know? For for me, uh, tattoos are 
a record of memory, or as people, Mm -hmm. we remember pain. We Mm -hmm. remember painful uh, situations more easily than we remember uh, the the high happy ones. Mm -hmm. But the memories can be good even though we're in pain and and uh, pleasure and pain sort of situation which mm-hmm. is cool mm-hmm. um yeah as far as the Ainu women's tattoos are considered it was painful actually because you teenage girl and then you have to get started right yeah. and then it's hours and even though oh there's disease disinfectant and so on but mm-hmm. you have Ask an older lady who is calm and who is mature and who is nice and pleasant because when somebody who is not like that would tattoo, then you start to have some kind of bad luck with it. Yes, yes. Yeah. And then also in the hot summertime and cold winter time, you're going to avoid that because it's kind of in, in pain. And mm-hmm. also the, um, sometimes you would have infections, you know, mm-hmm. so it has to be spring or uh, fall they have to you know have that tattoo done that works because spring and fall are liminal times mm. and perfect times for initiations of all sorts mm-hmm. and so the girl getting the tattoo is saying you're not a girl anymore you're becoming a woman mm-hmm. it also comes with responsibility too you know transition from child to adulthood and stuff like that. Yeah. We'll be right back. Okay, so the Aina religion is animistic and uh, naturalistic Mm -hmm. and um, it is very close to Shinto. And Shinto, as some of you know, is an indigenous animistic religion of Japan yes. where there are 8 million dots. That is, all natural events, natural things, natural phenomena, natural everything, you know, everything is kami, yeah. which means in Japanese. Yeah. So, you know, uh, kamikaze, yeah. or kamikaze, as some Americans do yeah. say, you know, so kami, kamikaze means God wind, you know, or godly wind, divine wind, something like mm-hmm. that. So kami means God, but not in the same sense as God as we speak in Christianity. So yeah. Christianity, there's just God Almighty, just one God, or in some other religions, it could be Allah or Yahweh or whoever. Mm-hmm. Uh In Shinto and also in Ainu, all natural object, okay, event, phenomena are you know, some kind of uh, kami, yeah. divine kind of um, situation. So the Ainu people, uh, they basically live in nature and they die in nature and they cherish nature and they are very ecological people. Mm-hmm. And um, their way of living is just very nice. I mean, it's very contemporary, actually. And uh, there is actually like ecotourism, you know, I, the Ainu version as well, which mm-hmm. I love. So, um, for example, like, you know, a lot of us, you know, contemporary people, we are greedy, aren't we? So mm-hmm. we are going to uh, go and pick up some mountain vegetables. So automatically we think the more the better. So let's just get all these vegetables from this mountain because, you know, there's abundance. Yeah. But what about the other people who are going to follow you, <laughs> you know, yeah. or next year? So the Ainu people, they are not, they're never ever over harvest, you know, which I think is a very good plan. So when there are like, like 10 items there, then they may pick like six or five, maybe. Okay. And then rest is going to leave for the next year or something like that. So not over harvesting and not taking away, you know, things which are more than necessary. So basically you would just get something just about right and just stop there mm-hmm. while for people, they're greedy and they want to get more and more and more. And then since your stomach is limited sometimes, so the more you may, you know, waste them as well, you yeah. know. So the Ainu people, 
do live in, in a very ecological way. And one of the things is like, do not waste anything, you know. So, uh, as I said, the food, okay, and the trees, flowers, or even human beings or whoever, any natural object can be, uh, kami, which is God. They do have a tremendous amount of respect to nature. And, um, that's what I really like. So anyway, so that they think that, um, the spirit, okay. And it's forced to live in the mountains, bears, foxes, plant, fish, water, fire, natural disasters, wind, earthquakes, uh, boats, dishes, and, uh, houses, horses, and just about everything and toilets. And I think that's neat. Like there's even, you know, coming in toilets. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I really like that. It's, that's interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, talking to uh, Einar Selvik last year, he brought up a good point that when things were so tough back in, in the old days, uh, say a thousand years ago, people were fighting against, na- against nature in quite a, a bad way and they separated themselves which is what happened with christianity and the modern uh, religions we we look at ourselves as separate but when you look at things animistically the animists look at nature you're part of nature you're part of everything that's around you and and everything has a, a life and meaning and that to me is the most beautiful thing yeah, so when I hear my, um, you know, religious friends who would, you know, talk about like Ash Wednesday, yeah. or Lent and um, Eastern stuff like that. And then so we all come from the ashes and then we go back to the ashes and say, yeah, that, that's what you know, we all are. So we're all part of nature. And then why do we need to hate each other? Or why do we need to fight with each other? And, you know, I mean, Human folly is there, definitely. Yeah. I mean, we need to stratify everything or we want to divide it into uh, duality, good and bad, for yes. example, about undesirable and stuff like that. So I really like um, that kind of um, religion which transcends duality, for example, become one with nature. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it, it's really nice because um, you know, the Aina has all these medicinal herbs, for example. Mm-hmm. So their medicine, for example, is not like a contemporary Western kind of medicine at all, but they do have all these herbs in the garden, which are good for stomach pain or headache or, or whatsoever. Yeah. And that is a natural way to cure your illness, you know. Yeah, traditional, traditional uh, ways but it's all of our modern medicines come from that they mm-hmm. they are at, at least most that we have are a derivative of it they they chemically uh condense it down and make it more mm-hmm. potent so that mm-hmm. they get more of the the desired effect but mm-hmm. uh if more of us had a little herb garden in our house mm-hmm. even yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't smoke pot, but pot is legal here. Mm-hmm. And we use pot for medicinal reasons. I said, where do pots come? Mm-hmm. I mean, they come from the factory. They do not come from chemical compounds. It's a natural herb. Yeah. That kind of makes sense to me, you know? Yeah, yeah it's one one thing that uh, I found, because I live on Vancouver Island. Mm-hmm. I came from Halifax City. I've lived and worked in cities. Mm-hmm. But living on an island, it slows really, it slows down. People live slower. Did you mm-hmm. find in dealing with the Ainu that they, from main, the main island of Japan to them, from the mega city like Tokyo? Uh, well, actually, um Lots of Ainu people who live in mega city like Tokyo or yeah. the surrounding area, 
And the interesting thing is, so I've read several books about written by these people who are Ainu and then they live in Tokyo, mm. the metal area. And one of the interesting things is like some of them do go back to Hokkaido and then they realize that the nature, you know, this abundance of clean air, you know, clean water and mm. serenity is really kind of calming to them. You know, because we, again, we all come from nature, right? Yeah. To a point in life is exciting. I mean, there is diversity, you know, like yeah. there are kinds of ethnic foods and different kinds of entertainment and everything, but we're all human beings and we all come from nature. Nature. Yeah. And also the Ainu people who live in the metropolitan area may not want to, you know, admit or advertise that they are part of the Ainu. And this is an interesting thing. Okay. So at the, I did say that Ainu are a racial and ethnic group, right? Mm-hmm. The race is not really a category because we're not like, you know, dogs or cows or anything categorizing people to one kind or the other, right? Yeah. I'm talking about like going to the zoo. Okay, the lions are cats and, okay, lions and tigers are the cats or no, yeah. tigers, cats and lions. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> there are these, uh, biological species that are different, right? Mm-hmm. And we talk about like species about human beings, which is kind of ridiculous too. Yes. You know, right. But yeah. we organize because we look different. Yeah. All right. So, so the interesting thing is, Okay, race is also a social construct. So if you say that you are Ainu, you are an Ainu. If you say you're not an Ainu, then you're not an Ainu because even though you may have the Ainu blood, but you identify differently, you know. Yeah. So race is not like species per se because there's this social construct part. So if you are an Ainu and you don't look like an Ainu, you know, so which way do you go to? Mm. So this is again very, very interesting. Like, for example, like if you're gay and then people don't know that you're gay, you know, would you come out to the people at certain places? Yes or no? That's a good question, isn't it? True. Because people would associate like, you know, like coming out as this category of a person or, or that kind of religious person or that kind of, you know, whatsoever yeah. people type you, right? So. If you live in the metropolitan area, such as Tokyo, there are lots of foreigners. Mm-hmm. There are foreign people who are working in Japan, and their skin colors are different. Their feature, facial features are different. So you can blend in a lot better if mm-hmm. you eat when you are looking like Ainu, too. So uh, there are different shades of uh, Ainu people, okay? So one of the women I met, she looked more like a Russian, okay. because, you know, very pale skin, big eyes, and long nose than, than the Japanese person. But she's Japanese, she said, right? Yeah. And then I so an Ainu man who looked like an Italian, like he looked exactly like my Italian friend from Sardinia. Okay. A little bit like uh, olive kind of skin in yeah. the face features, right? And then the other um, store owner, he looked like more like a Polynesian man. The people that you would find in Polynesia, you know, like regarding his facial features. So, so the different shades of all these facial features here, textures and skin colors among the Ainu. So if you are an Ainu blood has, you know, have Ainu blood and then you live in the metropolitan area, a lot of times you don't have to deal with any kind of uh, racial awareness or discrimination whatsoever because for some areas more used to you looking slightly different from other Ainu Japanese people. Yeah. You know. Where where outside the city would be more difficult to blend. Yeah, exactly. And then there's also uh people who are called Burakumin. I don't know if you have heard about them or not. No. But Burakumin are the descendants of an caste from the Tokugawa period, like during feudalism lasted more than 260 years, which is called Tokugawa period because the Tokugawa family was in the power. Okay. And also it's called Edo period. Edo is today's Tokyo. Okay. Yeah. That's where the quarters was located. So it is either called Tokugawa period in 
name of the family in power or Edo period after the name of the location of the headquarters. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Tokugawa period or the Edo period was basically a vegetarian kind of society. Okay. So you have to deal with animals or especially like dead animals or dead bodies, like human bodies and so on. Uh, you were considered contaminated because of that contact with death. Okay. Okay, which I think is interesting because we all die, you know, but still some people, oh, you're contaminated. Stuff like that, right? <laughs> so, yeah, people are funny. Mm. Anyway, so there were four castes, okay, during the Edo period. The samurai, you know, these uh samurai or bushi, you know? Bushi, yeah. Warriors, scholars, administrators, that kind of people. The second was peasants, farmers, mm-hmm. you know, built the land, agriculture people. And the third one was craft people who would make, you know, uh, functional devices, you know, like weaving or manufacturing, you know, basically uh, handy craft economy kind of people. The last one was a merchant. And merchants started to accumulate lots of money toward the end of that period. But this stratification was according to the Confucians, you know, Confucius, you know, productivity. And that is merchants. They are just the people who exchange goods and services and stuff. That is where they're at the bottom. So, so number five, these are the outcasts. So they were called Brachmen. So there are four castes plus one outcast, right? Mm-hmm. So this Brachmen, literally it means the Hamlet people. But they also refer to eta, which means full of filth, which means non-humans. Mm. Yotsu means four-footed. Okay. So the caste, all this caste and the outcast, they were emancipated in 1860s. Okay. Uh, basically the same time as the end of the civil war here in the United States. All right. But they do still have the stigma from their ancestry, you know. So it's like the African-Americans here in the United States suffer from social injustice or inequality Mm -hmm. that are based on who they are or what they're doing, but based on, say, the tradition of slavery that is deep-rooted, you know, uh, racism and so on. Do do you see that point? Yes. So the black men, a lot of them are in the western part of Japan. Okay, mm-hmm. but they're minority, and again, just like the Ainu people, they um, do not need to say, "Hey, I'm Brahmin." Okay, you, they you don't know from outside. Okay, yeah. when you do apply for a job, and then you would put down your address, like where you were born, for example, then they would know that you're one of them. Okay, because of the legislation, the companies. Okay, cannot ask the person, you know, where you come from question anymore, which is great because that's going to give them more chances for education, employment, housing, marriage, whatsoever, right? True. When you are in Hokkaido, and this is what I heard from a wife of an Aino man, okay, she said in Honshu, okay, there is this broccoling problem, Mm. like when you fell in love and you really want to get married and then one of you ought to be Brockman, okay? The other person may say, well, I may not want to get married because of whatever. Yeah. She says that there is no Brockman problem in Hokkaido because number one, there are not many Brockman in Hokkaido. Mm-hmm. And number two, a lot of, of people in Hokkaido don't know about the existence of Brockman. So it's, not be a problem. But what she said was, but instead of Brahmin problem, we have Ainu problem here. So she the northern part of Honshu and then she got got married to an Ainu man. And interestingly enough, he looked very Japanese because his mother was an Ainu. Yeah. She was a Japanese who was adopted by an Ainu. Oh, okay. So it kind of makes the situation kind of complicated, okay? It does. Let me tell you why he was an Ainu, even when his mother was Japanese and so on, okay? So 
Okay, so in the 1800s, the Japanese set up this Hokkaido colonization war. And then there are lots of Japanese people who immigrated from Honshu to Hokkaido, right? And Hokkaido is very, very harsh in wintertime. And a lot of people could not survive that kind of harsh weather. So the Japanese people, non-Aino Japanese people, would need to, you know, leave Hokkaido to go back. But they have toddlers or babies and so on. So they would leave them behind. So the Ainu couples, you know, especially uh, those who did not have their own children or Ainu couples, even with children, they would adopt these Japanese children and bring them up as the Ainu. Mm-hmm. So the kids who are of non-Ainu parents left behind they grow up speaking the Ainu language, learning the Ainu culture, but they look totally Japanese on the surface. Yeah, so that's the Ainu by an ethnic group kind of category. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this lady told me, so my husband can pass as Japanese because his mother was Japanese. His dad was Ainu, right? Yeah. Okay. So she's from north, from northern Japan, so she's non-Ainu Japanese, so on the surface, they look like a perfect non-Ainu Japanese couple, right? Yeah. People in the community know that he is Ainu because his father was full-blooded Ainu and his mother was a full-blooded Japanese, but since she was adopted, but she was an Ainu. So this lady said that a lot of people do not come knock on our door to say hello or to visit us or they would badmouth or gossip about them. And she said it was quite difficult to get used to that kind of treatment by both the Japanese people and the Ainu people in that community. Huh. It's the same same with my mother. When she came to Nova Scotia, she came from Quebec, Mm -hmm. which is a French-speaking place. And... It, so it took my mother 10 years before anyone would come and talk to her. Mm-hmm. And that that's kind of what what you just described there. Same situation. Yeah, it seems like, like it's universal almost. It's like human yeah. nature, you know. And um, so I taught this class this semester. And then um, there was a Native American uh, woman, you know, who was in my class. And then. I thought she was a white person, so I thought about her, you know, as the majority, okay? But yeah. she's from Oklahoma, and then she said, I am a Native American, but she happens to have white skin because her mother is white. Yeah. But she's a Native American, and she speaks the language, <laughs> and yeah. she, you know, uh, does all these cultural things with her group, but even her you know, group would ostracize her because she's looking too white and think that she belongs there. So it's not in Canada in your case or in Hokkaido's case, but it's right here in Little Rock, that kind of thing's going on. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Mm. People like to put things in boxes. Yeah, they do. They do. Even (laughs) even if what they're putting in a box is round. It it doesn't really fit the, the the if you don't fit the mold you're an outsider. Yeah. So for those you know I know people who are in the the uh, metropolitan area, so they do have a little bit easier time because they don't always have to be on their defense, you know, or being aware of being different. For example. Yeah. So. Um, the statistics say that there are about 24,000 Ainu people in Hokkaido yeah. and uh, like several thousand living in the Tokyo and uh, other metropolitan areas. But the statistics are not reliable. And I think you can guess why it is not re- reliable, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and if you can pass as a more favorable category, then you would go along with that. So I was quite surprised with my student because she was going with the Native Americans group, you know, even though she looked white and so on. And she's, she has pride as a Native American and she loves the tradition and culture and stuff like that. But we automatically think, 
because of how they appear sometimes, you know. It's true. Folklore. We haven't talked about folklore. We've talked a little bit about it with the religion. Mm -hmm. So what I, I got here is like folklore. And I assume that your audiences are like uh, English speaking people, yes. right? Yeah. There are lots, lots of publications in Japanese, but they're not translated. Yes. In order to prepare for this question, I went to Amazon.com and then I got like, you know, several uh, folklore things by uh, John Batchelor. And John Batchelor was a missionary mm -hmm. and actually went to the town where I did my ethnographic study. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, I think he lived in uh, 1800s, 1900s, something like that. And he has a whole bunch of, uh, at least several listed here in the Amazon. Uh, Amazon's, um, you know, dot com uh, Kindle store, mm -hmm. you know, and then some of the books, um, like I think this is my book. Wonderful. Yeah, this is this is twenty some dollars because of the cutter things, but you can get this for um, ten dollars. Okay. You know, e e yeah, okay. I know uh, tales from Hokkaido, and this basically. Um, Talks a little bit, uh, you know, this is an introductory book. So it talks about Ainu culture, Ainu history, Ainu language, and religion a little bit here and there. But mainly just like uh, my essays about people, you know, like um, just like in my movie. Mm -hmm. In my film, Have You Heard About the Ainu? I featured six, you know, Ainu people, but there were some others uh, that I did not really put into the film. Mm -hmm. So one time I said, I cannot die with all this knowledge and information. So the best way to do it, just kind of blurt it out. And so that's what I blurt it out and uh, wrote this book before I forget anything, because these, you know, some three dozen people, you know, mm -hmm. took time and then they contributed to my uh, studies. You know, I interviewed them or filmed them and so on. So the academic press is going to take a couple of years to publish, but Amazon, it's instant. So I said, well, I really have to do now or, or else. And uh, the I know elderly people that I interviewed or I filmed, they're dying. So, yes. you know, they're in their 80s and 90s. So, so I really felt that I have to do it. So that's my book and my films on YouTube. And also, um, you might want to read books by uh, Shigeru Kayano. Uh, Kayano is K-I-Y-A-N-O. The Ainu, the a story of Japan's original people, and uh, other books that, you know, he wrote. They are translated into English. You know, so there are um, lots of literature available, you know, online at uh, bookstores and uh, also YouTube, but there are certain YouTube videos that give wrong information too. I mean, anytime, true. <laughs> anytime you watch YouTube or something, you have to take with a grain of salt that because some people totally, um, you know, miss a point or they may provide you with misinformation mm -hmm. that could be typos or, you know, mispronunciation or whatever. Yeah, but at least, you know, if if you record certain things, it's going to be there for posteriority. True, you know? true. But if we're just talking like this, it's kind of evaporated. It's just between you and me, right? Yeah. But when you put it on YouTube and then a lot of people has an access and it's going to be archived and people from 100 years from now, they would know what was going on and say, well, it hasn't changed at all. <laughs> true, it's true. As much as things change, they stay the same. Yeah. yeah. One can hope that we progress a little bit spiritually and as a society mm -hmm. uh, a bit. Animism seems to be on a rise. Mm -hmm. And to me, animism is kind of a, a, a pure way of being mm -hmm. that helps to you, rec you begin to recognize I'm part of a system. Mm -hmm. But in in a way, everyone's included. It's all inclusive. Can can yeah. you tell us a little bit about uh, how do you say it? 
Golden. Yeah, Golden Kamui. Kamui. Golden from English, golden. And yeah. Kamui, Kamui means God, right? Yeah, so Golden Kamui is an award winning Japanese comics. And some of the listeners may already be familiar with the comics and also anime because、um, they happen just about everywhere.、Mm-hmm. And Uh, for a certain Western audience, you know, the manga or anime could be a little bit controversial because of the Western Puritan kind of perspective about things, you know.、Yeah. What I want to say is, but who are you to judge, you know, everybody? True, true. <laughs>、uh, right? I, I, I love anime.、Mm-hmm. Uh, Miyakazi is one of my favorites.、Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, It was years ago I saw、um, the wind. Wind, wind rises, yes.、Yep. And actually, I have an article in the International Journal of Comic Art on Hayao Miyazaki's Wind Rises. You know, I can send you an article. you know,、uh, Right now, I'm busy because I'm going to Japan on Thursday.、Yes. So I come back, then I can send you、uh, Hayao Miyazaki's、uh, academic paper that I wrote, okay? Oh, beautiful. Real. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Because、so, I have to go to my office and then print it, collate it, and then send it to you. So it's going to take some time.、Right. <laughs> But I promise. Let me just write it down, okay? All right. <laughs> yeah, Miyazaki's, Miyazaki's,、uh, wind, the wind rises. And、uh, it's very interesting about、um, how the historical contextual understanding helped that animation. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it, are educational. So, Golden Kami is an award winning Japanese、uh, comics and also animation、mm-hmm. and features this、uh, teenage girl as one of the protagonists. Her name is Asupa and she's、uh, 13 years old and she knows a lot about hunting and、uh, gathering and、uh, basically, you know, Ainu culture in general.、Yeah. And、uh, the other Uh, protagonist、uh, sidekicker is Sugimoto, and he's an ex soldier who went to、uh, the Russo Japanese War between 1904 and 1905. So both of them are interested in doing this adventure,、uh, seeking the treasure, in the treasure hunting basically, for Sugimoto to gain money and Asiopa to look for her lost father or something like that. But、yeah. anyway, So, this is the, almost the first time that any major Ainu protagonist appears in the comics or anime. And、uh, the author of this comics and animation, he did not want to come out very strongly about this teaching of Ainu culture or explaining things. So, that is why the protagonist is a teenage girl, you know. Yeah. Than an old Ainu man because teenage girl, she's cute, you know, kawaii kind of thing. Yeah. yeah.、Uh, Sugimoto, who is an ex soldier, can learn from her. So she knows the language, you know, the culture and everything. And so she teaches him all these things. So Sugimoto calls her like a sirupa san, you know, miss, show、yeah. respect to her because she's like a teacher of、yeah. Ainu culture. So the story,、um, Get started when they first meet, you know, and、uh, it develops and it's, it's goes to different places in Hokkaido. And then you learn, you know, Ainu language, Ainu food, Ainu religion, I, just about everything Ainu. And in regard, this is very, very educational because you can learn the culture, you know, as you read the comics, you know. And、uh, so there is definitely a, an education value.、Mm-hmm. in Comics and anime too, but at the same time, as with other Japanese comics or anime, anything goes. So,、um, it's maybe considered as violent here and there, or it's maybe taken as,、uh, you know, a little bit of pornography.、Mm-hmm. You know,、uh, so、people who are homophobic may say, oh, what's this? You know, here and there, there are some, you know, social. social. Controversial, but overall, the comics and Ainu is very educational regarding 
kind of culture and history. And that's very, very important because once people get interested in the topic, then that can lead to more understanding and more compassion and more peace later on because mm. they can understand, you know, as again, as I said, you know, ignorance is never ever a bliss. No. And ignorance to all of these bad things. So in that sense, you know, this golden comedy is highly recommended to people who want to learn Ainu culture. And uh, the story is quite nice. And uh, the content um, is mostly educational when it comes to Ainu culture. So I would highly recommend it. And I purchased all like 29 volumes. <laughs> okay. Them, yeah. I, I have to I have to get some some of them. But now now I've watched a little bit of it, I'm probably gonna mm-hmm. end up buying the co- all twenty nine copies myself. <laughs> yeah, actually it's a page turner, which is yeah. interesting. Yeah. And uh you know, learning about the other person's perspective, that's very uh eye opening. Yeah. No, because a lot of times we tend to be conservative and we are defensive and ethnocentric as well. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times when you see where the other person is coming from, then you can really broaden your perspective and your um, your understanding of the world. And that's the topic of my second documentary film. I have two films. Uh, Have you heard about the Ainu? You know, part one, which talks about um, the elders of the Japan's indigenous group speak. And the second one was... um, uh, have you heard about the Ainu uh, toward a better understanding and world peace, something like that? I can't even remember the titles of my films, but <laughs> but they are available on YouTube. And um, I think uh, once people get interested in the Ainu, then that's just the first step for everyone to learn about them. True. And uh, we can learn from history. Mm-hmm. So that never ever. Uh, you know, make the same mistakes again. It's true. Do you have anything that you would like to promote before we finish? Yeah, my uh, two movies. Have you heard of the Ainu? Part one and part two. And then I write books with my pen name, K dot I dot Peter, like P E E L E R. Yeah, this was fun. This is great. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. And uh, I really had fun with you. I had fun too. Thank you very much. Okay, so bye. 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 You. Have a good day. <laughs> you too. I wish to thank Dr. Ito for coming on with us to talk about the Ainu people of Japan. Too many indigenous peoples are being lost to time, and it's important to preserve their legacy so that they'll never be lost. Dr. Ito's book on Ainu and YouTube channel are listed below in the show notes. Please check them out and share them. Please like, follow, and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. Thank you for listening and we'll see you soon.